Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Um, Announcements very briefly. One, uh, 5.30 this evening at Redeeming Grace again. Uh, Evening worship, I'll be preaching this evening. Uh, Two, uh, you should have gotten the email from Church Social this week about kind of the the new church calendar and the way it's going to be functioning with... um, yeah, what's moving toward in-person activities. Uh, that being said, uh, prayer meeting at church uh, this Wednesday. And if you were to pay good attention to that email, you'd have seen that we're going to be working toward flocks at the end of this month, um, not inside flocks the way we have done, but more of outside picnic time um, so that we're able to keep a respectable social distance and not share food and stuff like that. Um, but if you didn't get that email somehow, let me know and we'll make sure that we get you access to it. Uh, and then likewise, if you didn't somehow find out, uh, via the email, uh, praise the Lord, give great uh, thanksgiving to him. We got the M and a loan at the end of this week, uh, even able to get it signed and submitted back to them, uh, Friday afternoon, even while Tom was recovering from cataract surgery, he was able to get all of that squared away, which is amazing. Uh, so we can give thanks to the Lord for that. If you didn't, hadn't followed, uh, the bank loan was enough to get the building built, which was really marvelous, but it wasn't enough to make it any fun, namely things like, you know, chairs and paint and stuff like that on the inside. Uh, so this gets to, to take care of some of the creature comforts along the way. So we can certainly give thanks to the Lord for that. I mean, it was really special. We prayed Wednesday night at prayer meeting, got the loan Thursday morning, you know, um, really, really sweet. So, take a few moments uh, as the prelude is uh, played and prepare your hearts to meet with God. The Lord is made able. Please stand. Psalm 93. <clears throat> the Lord reigns. He's robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters. Mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Let's praise him singing, Jesus shall reign.
Father in heaven, we do delight that we can join in with the song of creation. Each creature bearing that peculiar praise, uh, that which is unique to them, and how you have made each creature uh, with the complexity and creativity and wisdom that you have displayed. We bless you. We also rejoice that we may sing not just the song of creation, but the song of Christ coming to you in his name with the great mediator, the great intercessor, as our go-between, offering to you Christ in the substance of our offering, the content, the joy, the hope, the, the faithfulness of our offering. It's Christ. And so we rejoice that we have this unique privilege in all of creation. We, your people, bring Christ as our mediator. And so we do pray, O oh God, that you would be glorified to receive him and to meet with us. We ask that you would be glorified to send your spirit to equip us for this service. We ask that you would be glorified, O oh God, in drawing forth songs from our mouths and obedience from our hearts, that we would grow more and more into the image of our beloved Savior, the Lord Jesus, who's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. Scripture reading, Romans chapter 3. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. For all have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. All have sinned. Our only hope is in the Lord Christ. Let's stand and sing, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness.
Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. <clears throat> Prayer of intercession from Psalm 131. Let's pray. And Father, this Psalm David begins by explaining. His heart is not lifted up, his eyes not raised too high. He is not to occupy himself with things that are too great and too marvelous for him, but instead is calm and quiet in his soul before you. For you alone are his hope. And Lord, we confess <laughs> this temperament is often one that does not match ours. As we are filled with the hustle and bustle of life, filled with the busyness of a postmodern age, filled with the blessings and many curses that come with technology, the speed of life that is, I guess, would have been inconceivable to David and his time. And we confess that too often, uh, it's not that our, our hearts are lifted up too highly or our eyes raised too high. It's that we just don't pause to think at all. That we do not stop and quiet our soul before you and reflect upon all that you are doing in the world and in our lives. And we confess that we have fallen short of your perfect command here. We have not um, sought your glory even in how we have thought about the world. And we ask for your forgiveness in Christ Jesus. And so we do pause and reflect for just a little bit as to what you're doing in your church. We begin with thanksgiving. Oh God, you have blessed us richly in so many ways, but now particularly blessed us in answering our prayers with this loan from m &A. And we rejoice. Oh God, another loan that uh, no interest to be paid back to the denomination. We bless you. Thank you for being our provider to get that building built out front that we may meet together in one service again, at least for a season. We bless you that you have provided enough that we would be able to purchase chairs and other things useful and needful for the building. And we praise you. We praise you that you continue to work in this world and have not let it go and left it to its own ends. And we praise you that you have placed Christ Ridge in this particular place, that we might be that salt and light to Fort Mill and Tiga Cay and Indian Land and South Charlotte and Rock Hill. And Father, we ask that you would indeed make us that very salty salt and very bright light and that your name would go forward. We even ask that against all human understanding, you would even grow your church both numerically and spiritually in this COVID time so that when we are all gathered together again, that we might be surprised at the new faces that have been a part of this church for weeks or months that we have not seen before. Again, humanly speaking, this is impossible, but you have told us nothing is impossible with God. You know, we particularly pray for um, your church as we are, are aware the the natural temptation of listening to our own voice too readily when it is the only voice we hear or the pockets of the internet that agree with us. And now we look at a time in which so many of your people have been confined in their homes across this country for so many weeks, in some places uh, a very long time. And we pray that you would guard and keep your people's hearts, particularly that our ears would be open to the scriptures, that we would listen to your voice instead of our own voice. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. 
And we ask, O oh God, instead that we would listen to your word, which is where life is found. We also contemplate uh, this kind of moment of, of, of cultural crisis that we're in right now. As our nation wrestles through what to do with its history, and what to do with its present, and what to do with its future. And Lord, we grieve that uh, even as we contemplate the past of this nation, we can easily contemplate um, really how, how weakened the church has grown over the hundreds of years that we have been in this, uh, <clears throat> this continent. We love this uh, country. We see the church, though, that has struggled. That the affluence has made us um, spiritually fat and lazy. That we grieve. That we grieve for a church that is, in some places, uh, still radically divided based not on preference or theological conviction, but in some cases even based on race that grieves us. And so we pray, O oh God, that you would bring healing to your church, that you would make us humble and holy and strong, that you would make us united in Christ, that you would fill us with your spirit, give us deep abiding love of your word, that even as we watch a world that is, in many ways, almost even imploding right now, that they would be able to see the church has something different. The church has both atonement and forgiveness, something that the world doesn't understand right now. They offer atonement with no forgiveness. That the church offers unity, deep-seated, abiding unity, a unity that crosses uh, culture and backgrounds, and race and um, language. Would the world see that? There's a better way. It's found in Christ. Would the world see that there is truth found in Christ? And in the scriptures, oh God, we pray that uh, really ultimately what we ask for is what we've been asking for for weeks now in relationship to COVID and and this um, other cultural moments that are around us now, we pray for revival in the land. That you would grow your church. That you would even use all of the, the turmoil of a dying culture to showcase to people they need a better way. And his name is Christ Jesus. Oh Lord, would you help, we pray. For Christ's sake, amen. Take your insert. We'll confess our faith together. Christian, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead 
and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Let's give thanks for the tithes and offerings. Lord, we bless you. You have been so generous to us, so generous with us. You have given us Christ. You have given us your spirit, and that would be more than enough. And yet, you have given us also great financial blessing. And so we do return a portion of it to you, that which is commanded in the tithe, and that which we give um, and joyfully, freely uh, in the offering. We bless you and ask that you would use it to grow your church in numbers and in faith. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's stand and sing the doxology. Amen. Be seated, please. Take your Bible and turn to Job. I am excited. We're working on designing the pulpit in the new building, and it will be larger than this one so that I don't have to stack everything while I'm trying to preach. I have four stacks currently on this tiny little bit. All right, Job chapter 40, and then they move, and it gets worse. Stop moving. All right, Job chapter 40. And the Lord said to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account. Uh, what shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I've spoken once and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God and can you thunder with a voice like His? Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and abase him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them in all the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then I will also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can save you. Behold, behemoth, which I made as I made you. He eats grass like an ox. Behold, his strength is in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. He makes his tail stiff like a cedar and the sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs are bars of iron. He is the first of the works of God. Let him who made him bring near his sword. For the mountains yield food for him where all the wild beasts play under the lotus plants. He lies in the shelter of the reeds and in the marsh. For his shade the lotus trees cover him. The willows of the brook surround him. Behold, if the river is turbulent, he's not frightened. He's confident though Jordan rushes against his mouth. Can one take him by his eyes or pierce his nose with a snare? One more verse and then I'll stop. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Let's pray. Lord God, you have spoken again in your word as we have read it. We ask now that you would speak in its preaching that we might 
hear from heaven. We bless you and ask for your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I tend to suspect that when we actually contemplate kind of the history of mankind, one of the great mistakes in human history was the invention of the internet. I suspect that when we actually look at it, it's one of those things that everybody says is a helpful tool and we can't really live without, but it ends up being probably a bit more detrimental to mankind uh, than it is beneficial, at least the way we use it. Uh, I do, however, enjoy many privileges from it, and one of the ones that I have enjoyed over the years is um, the this, this sense of awareness that we are now able to have as a people, as, as a mankind, of the, the kind of unity and diversity of how God has made the globe. You know how, as a kid, I could watch the nature shows, which my family was very aggressive in watching. We, uh, you know, had Ranger Rick in the house always and had, uh, you know, PBS, all the nature shows on television all the time. So we were able to kind of see how God made the world. But now, I guess, with the arrival of the Internet, it's kind of created globalism of, of a negative kind, but in some sense a positive kind, as we're able to enjoy so much more of God's creative order able to interact and to learn about the things that you just never have been able to learn about, I guess, 50 or 100 years ago. If you read not uh, too long ago, remember they found a shark up in uh, just north of Greenland that they thought had been extinct, and this particular shark was something like 800 years old. You know, it, it swims at like a half a mile an hour, barely even moves, and just kind of lets food fall into its mouth, and it's, you know, been alive longer than this country, that particular, amazing. Or the, again, not too long ago, this is, I guess, better part of a decade, but uh, to watch a goblin shark eat for the first time. If you've ever seen a goblin shark, they're the most hideous and amazing creatures ever. A goblin shark looks completely normal until it goes to eat, but then its jaws actually project out from its body. It has gojo, go-go gadget mouth that, you know, kind of comes out, and it eats the, sh- the fish like, you know, a foot and a half in front of its body and then pulls it back into its mouth. It, it's the most gruesome and bizarre-looking thing. It, it's absolutely wild. Even this week, if you got to see it again, the beauties of the Internet, I guess it was a great white shark that they have kind of first time documented ever uh, that had survived a battle with one of the giant squids of the deep. Uh, It had like sucker marks all over its back from where it had been attacked and you could see the little beak marks from where it had tried to kill it and the the shark had survived. Amazing uh, to be able to contemplate um, so much of God's created order. The amazing thing though is that What, 4,000 years after this book is written, give or take? We understand so much more about the creative or created order than Job did when this was written. And as much as we understand, there's even more we have no idea. Absolutely no idea. So an article this week where scientists were measuring the background radiation of the universe, and obviously they're old Earth scientists, they believe the world is very, uh, very old, but they had somehow managed to lose 200 billion years of time. Couldn't figure out where it came from, ha- ha- where it had gone. They they'd lost uh, a substantial amount of time. Like, eh, that's, that's a really great question. How you lost that much time, I have no idea. Another group of scientists this week were uh, measuring the effect of two black holes colliding in two separate galaxies, and they had no idea what to expect. And I love that, how, yeah, our questions have different kind of objects, but they're the same sort of questions that we're going to deal with in the text here today. How does the world work? Again, the flow of the book, Job suffered terribly. He's righteous. He's uh, been given uh, by the Lord's hand. Uh, the devil has been given permission to uh, pester Job and has destroyed what we consider destroyed his life. He's taken his kids away, 
and taken his wealth away, taken his health away, uh, left him with a wife who has given him poor counsel, at least at the beginning. Often with friends who, though they seem to love him and sit with him, they call him names and accuse him of, of secret sin that he hasn't had. And here in this section, we find out that, yeah, he, he doesn't have secret sin. In fact, the Lord doesn't really rebuke him. He questions him for uh, maybe pushing his reasoning too far, but doesn't scold him. In fact, the next week's sermon, uh, we'll see exactly uh, how the Lord does rebuke in this passage. But here we've finally gotten to the end of the book where Job's friends have been saying, Job, you're sinful, where uh, Job himself has been saying that he's not. Who's going to win? How's it going to win? Job's kind of at the heart of his argument has been, well, if I've done something wrong, I at least deserve the right to face my accuser. God needs to come and talk to me because he's accusing me of doing evil. My friends are as well. I at least need to see his, I, I at least need to be able to answer the charges. It's unfair to level charges without giving me opportunity to answer. Well, <laughs> Job 38 through 42, God answers. And it's not the answer that maybe you might expect. Again, we know the book very well, most of us, I would guess, but maybe not the way that we would expect uh, the Lord to answer us. He really answers him with just a series of questions. There's not a great deal of argument, uh, per se, in the Lord saying kind of uh, indicative, this is the way the world is, and this is the way that you are, and therefore, imperative, this is the way that you should act. Instead, it's a list of questions. Beautiful, poetic, lovely, but questions. And I guess as we first kind of look at that is to be aware of, uh, and I guess most parents understand this, when you ask the question, did you clean your room yet? Is that simply a question? Right? Of course not, right? It's not just an information gathering. I don't know the answer. Have you actually cleaned your room? What, what is implied in that? You should have cleaned your room. And if you have not, why are you talking to me now? You should be cleaning your room. We all do this in various settings and various ways in life where we ask questions that are questions grammatically but are actually intended to showcase something else. They're intended to teach or intended to accuse, uh, maybe even uh, intended to give commands, but they're uh, intended to accomplish something uh, greater than simply gathering information. That's exactly what the Lord does as he answers Job. He begins in chapter 38 uh, with this opening kind of uh, explanation. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? <laughs> Whose ignorance is like a cloud blocking out the sun? Certainly, Job, in some sense, is friends far more. That's why they're going to get the scathing rebuke in 42. But the answer is, in some fashion, Job is speaking beyond what he understands. In third, uh, uh, 38 verse 3, dress for action like a man. Gird up your loins. If you're wearing a long toga, you know, reach between your legs, grab the back of it, pull it through, wrap it in your belt, get ready to run. It's time to move. God's coming to talk with you. I will question you, and you make it known to me. And what the Lord does is interesting in chapter 38 is he begins with really it's just a question of your eight, what we consider like eighth grade life science questions. Working through various illustrations inside creation of how God made them and questioning Job if he understands how they work. He begins generally with creation, verses 4 through 7. And do you know how creation worked? Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Where, where were you when I made it? Where were you? Do you understand exactly how it operates? I love this. This is a question that is, is no less accurate and real and, and pertinent today. I remember the first time I read um, A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. 
Right? Stephen Hawking, one of the greatest minds in kind of modern uh, memory, uh, certainly dealing with science and dealing with kind of the past and how uh, the cosmos came to be and everything, and I, I, I'm not persuaded by his arguments, but I, I will always remember he has one section where he said, look, you can, you can trace kind of all of the, the, what we would call the created order. You can trace all matter back to a point. But after that, before that point, there's no way for us to know. We can trace it back to a Big Bang, but prior to the Big Bang, we can't tell you what caused it. It's impossible for us to tell. I remember his, he even makes the argument, he says, if there is a God, he might have been able to do that. I don't think he, there's a God, but he could have done that. I'm not sure. There's no way for us to know. And again, Hawking, I believe, was wrong. But it's intriguing how he himself is actually <laughs> articulating the heart of God's question. Where were you when I started the world? I'm not, well, we weren't there. I mean, even if mankind, we, we weren't there as a species, uh, but much less us personally. We don't know. We don't know. Right? There's an argument being made now that creation took place, as biblical creation took place on, on the event horizon of a black hole. I love that argument. It's really interesting. I can't tell you if it's true or not because I wasn't there. And God hasn't told me. From creation, verses 4 through 7, he turns to the sea. Laying out all of the complexities of the sea. Uh, were you in charge of it? Again, remember, Jews were terrified of the sea. They hated it. It was a portrait of instability. It's where trouble came from. It's where invaders came from. It was not a place they were happy to live. Are you the one in charge of the sea? This question is one that would be like taking a small child and saying, are you the one in charge of the dark? I know you're afraid of the dark. Are you in charge of the dark? Or if you're afraid of thunder, if the child is afraid of thunder, are you, are you in charge of the thunder? Well, of course you're not. Working through God's administration of the earth, dealing with the underworld, death and such, light and darkness, even in verses 22 through 30, dealing with the storm itself. My favorite, though, is in verses 39 and following, where he starts getting into the various animals. Obviously, I love thinking about the animals. They're fun to consider. Verses 39 through 41, you have the lions and the ravens. Are you the one who's in charge of these animals? Can you hunt for a lion? Can you provide for a raven? Are you the one who is able to? And I love how uh, what God is presuming is an ounce of humility. I love how our current culture would be like, yes, we can do that. Right? We can manage any type of zoo you want us to manage. We can provide for any sort of critter that you want us to provide for. And it's like, oh my goodness. Getting into 39, where he begins with the mountain goats and these amazing creatures. Uh, I saw a, um, a video, I think it was from the COVID time just recently, where uh, goats had accidentally gotten into like a, a, a Swiss or Italian village, and some of the brick buildings were made on a slight angle, and so the goats started climbing the buildings, because why not? They're accustomed to climbing mountains. Bricks with a, you know, a half inch of overhang, that's plenty for them, and so they started scaling the buildings, and people were looking out windows, and there'd just be this goat like, you know, hanging out outside there, like, uh. I don't know what to do. There's a mountain goat like right there. What am I supposed to? I love it. It's marvelous. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? And again, what a question this is because uh, mountain goats are those that would go places that we as humans usually can't go. Are you able to observe the, uh, you know, the breeding habits of this creature that lives in a place where you can't be? Well, no, of course not. You can't know that. Can you number the months that they fulfill and do you know the time when they give birth? We might be able to give an answer to that now. We might have an idea of what the gestational period for a mountain goat is. We, we might have studied that, but the point being in the time in which Job is living, he wouldn't have known that. The same way that if this chapter was written today, we would have all sorts of new questions written. Do you know the gestational period of a goblin shark? I don't. I have no idea. I just think they're hideous and amazing to watch when they eat. Do you know the breeding habits of a Greenland shark? 
No, we don't even, I mean, we don't even know how, where those things are. We don't know how long they've been alive. No, we don't know. From mountain goats to wild donkeys, I, I want to high zone in here, focus in on uh, verse 9 of chapter 39. Uh, you get three kind of really fun ones in a row that I think it shows a, a little bit of a character of God that we don't tend to often highlight. Chapter 39, verse 9, he deals with what is called in the ESV the wild ox. Uh, If you were to know your um, ancient mythological creatures, there is one that is treated as mythological. It's actually quite real. It's called the aurochs, which is what he's describing here. It's not just a wild ox. It's a giant wild ox. So think ox except grossly larger. And it's a very real creature. They actually were alive not as long ago as you would expect, maybe a couple hundred years ago. That's what's being described here is the wild ox, this giant ox. Is he willing to serve you? Right? No, no, of course not. He's so big, they were untamable. I think, think buffalo except even bigger, these huge creatures. Can you bind him in the furrow with ropes? You can't control this one. Will he uh, harrow the valleys for you? Will he actually plow for you? No, you can't control him. He's too big. He's too wild. He's absolutely gigantic. Are you able, are you strong enough? Are you mighty enough to control him? No. Here in verses 9 through 12, contemplating the most kind of brilliant, strongest animal that would have been known in the land at the time. And goes from perhaps what is the strongest animal known at the time to perhaps the silliest animal known at the time. The ostrich. The wings of the ostrich wave proudly. Have you ever watched an ostrich run? Right? It's like all goofy with their wings kind of flat. It's like they don't have proper control over their body. But they are pinions and plumage of love, are they really? She leaves her eggs on the earth to be warmed on the ground, forgetting that a foot may crush them and that the wild beast may trample them. She deals crudely with their young as if they're not hers. She's a foolish creature. Uh, that the, uh, though her labor be in vain, she has yet no fear because God has made her forget wisdom. <laughs> Why is she so dumb? <laughs> because the Lord delights in this foolish creature. He's made this ridiculous bird. And he delights in it. I mean, you get the impression that the Lord is in essence saying in some point, she makes him laugh. If you ever watched ostrich wrangling, it's fantastic. You know how you actually wrangle an ostrich, how you get control of an ostrich? You literally just run up and grab it and yank it down by the back of the neck and hope it doesn't kick you and break your leg. It's the most ridiculous looking thing because these birds are all counterbalanced and all really kind of awkward and funny. And once you get control of their neck, they can't stand up right. It's, It's the most hysterical thing. I love watching them. They're fantastic. It's actually one of my favorite movies as a uh, moments as a child in my childhood movies. You ever remember Swiss Family Robinson, the old Swiss Family Robinson? You remember the part kind of right when they're having the middle of the play day and he's wrestling with the ostrich and he ends up riding the ostrich and running away? That was actually not part of the movie. He was actually trying to get control of the bird and the bird got spooked and took off with him as he was on its neck and literally just kind of threw a leg over her and she drug him off, running off into the, you know, uh, the woods outside uh, the set. Fantastic little bit. And then goes to the horse and the horse. What, what, what is God doing here? Right, we have all of these marvelous creatures. What is, what is God doing here? Uh, and the Lord is, is showcasing just a tiny little portion of his creation, instructing Job, by the way, you don't understand quite as much as you think you do. There's so much you do not know. There's so much. Just consider a a, a dozen animals or so, and, and you don't know how any of them work, all of which would have in some way been 
things that he's familiar with. And if you don't know how they work, how on earth are you going to expect to understand how the entirety of the created order works? You just don't get it. You just, you don't have all of the information. You just don't know. I mean, as we often hear joked about today, you don't know what you don't know. You, you just can't, there's so much outside of our frame of understanding. 38 and 39 lay this out very clearly in a series of questions that are designed as not mean-spirited or even to be harsh, but intended to continue to ram that point home. The Lord is intending this in such a way that Job is not left with, uh, he's left fully with his dignity, but he's not left with room to say, but I know God. But I, but I understand. I, I understand the world. In fact, actually, the way the Lord frames this out is to put Job into a position where he's left saying, look, I don't understand. The things I know are so small in comparison to the things I don't know. The things I, I uh, understand, I may not even be able to say I comprehend, but the things I understand are, are so small in comparison to the things I do not. That's the first kind of setup in the Lord's argument. And then in chapter 40, it takes a very specific and special kind of application almost. Who are you, Job, to question my justice if you don't even know everything I'm doing? Who are you, Job, to question my plans, to question my perfect providence, to question my plans for you? If you don't even understand all that I'm doing, you don't even know what to question because you're not even aware of all of it. As lovely, you know, pointed out in this book in a lovely fashion, he's not aware of chapters one and two, right? He doesn't know that the Lord is showing him off as this righteous man. He doesn't know that the Lord is in process of recording Job as a holy man for all of posterity to see. For thousands of years, we've been reading about how Job is a righteous man. Job doesn't know that. So when he's talking with God and saying, I want a hearing. I want to be able to answer my charges. I want to face my accuser. He has no idea what he's asking for. Because he doesn't understand all of God's plan. His perspective is so limited. For me, I think of this as from the perspective of horizon, right? All humans, we live with a horizon constantly. There's, there's always a point, actually physically, there's always a point that you can't see past, right? If you were to walk outside the front doors of the sanctuary now and you were to look to your right, you would not be able to see past the giant holly and weed wall. And if you were to look to your left, you would not be able to see past the giant wall of trees in that gentleman's backyard. If you were to look forward, you would either have your vision blocked by the building or the crest of the hill, but you can't see past that. There could be a dinosaur running down the road right there on Gold Hill. We would never know because we can't see it. Our perspective is limited. And in essence, God is, is questioning Job and saying, Why, who are you to complain when you have such a small perspective? We can walk out of our front door here on the property and we can see approximately four acres and nothing more. We can't even see the road out front. Can't see the building across very well. Our four acre perspective is all it is. We, we don't know. Who are we to complain who are we to grumble and gripe? Who are we to claim God's injustice? Who are we? And then uses two illustrations, famous illustrations in the book. Behemoth and Leviathan. Uh, I would suggest to you that they are very poetic renditions of the hippopotamus and the crocodile. Two of the most terrifying creatures uh, from that part of the world. 
case you don't know, hippos are not just the adorable little stuffed things that you give you know, uh, babies when they're young and so they can play with the squishy cute hippo. Uh, they are creatures of abject terror, right? They are the most fatal creatures in the uh, African, uh, except for I think mosquitoes are the ones that top them. They're absolutely horrible. Uh, live in the water during the day, live in the land at night. Um, they tend to be ridiculously territorial, uh, very, very uh, ill-tempered, extremely angry, and so large they kill you without even intending to. And they're uh, really um, <laughs> the, uh, the nice ones, so to speak, in comparison. You have the crocodile, the next one. Terrible creatures of, of, of power, obviously designed to be fatal. No major weaknesses known to them. Right? They're armored. Uh, they have iron stomachs so they can eat rotten food. They can live under the water. They can breathe uh, just uh, every little bit. They're amazing creatures of power. And Lord saying, look, you're not even powerful enough to handle the things that live right next to you. <laughs> How do you think you can manage the created order as a whole? You can't handle the two beasts that live down the street from you. How do you think you're going to handle the, the, big, the big picture order? Now, I would, I would contend that, you know, certainly for most of us, many of us, this is probably not uh, the, the style of communication that we're accustomed to, but we're certainly not in Job's situation. Most of us at this point in our lives are not sitting here going, well, God, what are you doing? I'm going to gripe, I'm complaining, I'm angry, I'm, you know, whatever. There are, however, I would suggest a number of things that we do need to take away from these chapters and, and, and kind of shape our minds. First and foremost, I, I believe that uh, Christians are all in some form or fashion to be scientists. And by that I mean we are to be creatures of design to, to be enraptured with wonder at the created order. Right? We're, supposed to, we're, we're supposed to be in awe marveling at what the, what the Lord has made, right? Yesterday, trying to kill a spider on the house and realizing the spider's nest had just had little spider babies, and so as I pull my shoe away, watching all of the little Charlotte's Web, you know, go blowing off all over my yard with the little bits of, you know, thread that the Lord had made. Amazing. To have a sense of wonder that God has designed the universe the way that he has. I think sometimes, and again, this is where I would suggest maybe the internet's not been our best friend, Photoshop's been worse. Um, we've lost that sense of wonder at what God is doing. We've forgotten to marvel at his creation We've forgotten to just take a moment to reflect on with wonder at what he's doing. And the amazing thing is it doesn't have to be, you know, the big and the great and the grand. In fact, actually, so many of the things are, are the things that we should contemplate are, are just simple, ordinary things. That in my neighborhood, if you walk the neighborhood, you can, they have a little bag of, uh, a box where you can get bags to pick up your dog's mess when you walk your dog. And, um, the bags ran out for just a couple of days, and in the couple of days that they were out, birds got in there, made a nest, and laid eggs. <laughs> These amazing creatures that have hollow bones and no stomachs are able to make a nest in just a matter of moments, lay eggs, and then raise their young right there in the place where all of the dogs go, and yet they're able to do that. We should marvel at what God is doing. Marvel at how he's made the world. I would suggest there's another one that maybe is a bit more even appropriate to contemplate in our current moment, and it is this. Christians should be people of intense humility because we should constantly be aware of the end of human knowledge. I was just talking about this just Friday with a group of pastors, how we were sharing one of the great struggles in our kind of uh, cultural moment right now that we're living in is, is we have a culture that is um, so convinced it's right and it's unwilling to dialogue. And the interesting thing is, is it, in order to, to be that convinced that you're right and to be unwilling to discuss with anyone else, um, you either have to know that you don't know it all and therefore be a liar, 
where you have to pretend that you know it all and therefore be a narcissist. And the problem is neither of those are Christian options. We as Christians, more than anyone, should be those that understand we don't have all knowledge. God is abundantly clear throughout all throughout the scriptures. There are secret things that belong to God and are not shared with us. There are horizons everywhere. I do not see past. I don't know. And to give me the freedom to be humble, to engage in dialogue, to be able to listen and to learn, and the freedom to be absolutely 100% dogmatic, unchanging, unyielding when it comes to biblical truth. It gives me the freedom to be flexible and say, I don't understand parts of God's created order, but I understand the gospel and I'm not changing on that. I understand the Ten Commandments. I'm not changing on that. We can have a conversation about politics. We can have a conversation about um, you know, the inner workings of the Nepalese ecosystem. I won't know anything about that, but we could talk about it. It should give Christians this great freedom, though, is to, to be humble on the things that we don't know because we understand there's always more that we don't know because our God has told us such. He's told us that we don't know at all. We're finite creatures. We have limited perspectives. We have limited horizons. We don't have to be afraid of that. Thirdly, it would also give us, I, I think, great comfort and consolation to build the habit of focusing on who God is rather than the way circumstances look. It's easy for us to, in limited perspectives, with limited horizons, only able to see a little bit, it's easy for us to then therefore say, everything is bad or everything is good or this is the way the world works or woe is me, whatever else it is. I mean, just example, just a few weeks ago, it would have been easy for us to look at this four acres and think all of Fort Mill had been destroyed in a windstorm. In fact, actually, one building was destroyed in a windstorm. It was the one right in front. But instead, because we understand the wisdom of God and know that there's more out there, we're able to instead rest in who he is knowing that he's in charge, knowing that his plan is going to be implemented perfectly. And again, I love to think about this. Think about the disciples right after the crucifixion. Right? They go running back, they go hide in the upper room, and they're in panic mode because their little bit of four acres that they can see is really bad. The Messiah was just murdered on a cross. Oh, no! What are we going to do? You know, woe is me, this is so bad. And now with us, with you know, a little bit more perspective, we say, that was the best day in human history. My sins were paid for on that cross. Jesus redeemed me on that cross. You guys don't need to go weep and moan. You need to be rejoicing. Yes, the Lord of life was murdered. Absolutely, he's going to rise again. That's not strong enough to hold him. Your perspective is too small. You just don't know yet. So it should give us a great privilege and great opportunity that whenever we do see negative circumstances or see very positive circumstances, to instead of evaluating the circumstances, to evaluate the God who has told us about them. That he is in charge. That he is mighty. That he is powerful. Because again, otherwise it puts us in the position of of trying to treat him as a peer, trying to proclaim ourselves to be our own sort of Christ, and then eventually even putting us in a position where we can claim our own righteousness and knowledge. We don't need a mediator. We don't need an intercessor. And I would end with one final point. Here the Lord is using the created order to, to kind of draw out from Job this idea that there are things too marvelous for us to understand. I would suggest that not just the created order, but there's probably one story that is more deeply important to each individual one of us 
Uh, and that is our own story of salvation. A story that I think when we're clear-minded, all of us would say it's too wonderful for us to even fully understand. The way that the Lord ordered the events of our life. The, the moments of sorrow that he, He's punctuated our lives with in order to accomplish salvation or sanctification. And when we contemplate the, the big picture of our life, we would have to say, surely you're doing things that are too wonderful for me to understand. I, I don't even understand all of them now. <laughs> But I know that you're good. And I know that you love me. And I know that Jesus has accomplished my salvation. So I don't have to be afraid. I can stick to my guns and know that God is good. And not worry about the rest. May it be that our hope in his sweet promises would increase, that we would appreciate in a greater fashion that free offer of God's grace that is accomplished in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it stirs in us thoughts that we don't normally think about, but we should. And we ask, O oh God, that you would indeed forgive us for our sin. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing, let us love and sing in wonder. Amen. Be seated, please. <clears throat> the words of institution in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Um, I, I appreciate the sacraments uh, for a number of reasons, but one of which, particularly in light of this sermon, is 
how well they show exactly what we're just talking about. <laughs> you don't understand it all, but God does. That word sacrament is drawn from the Latin, which means mystery. We don't understand all of exactly the mechanics of what's taking place here. We know a number of things that Jesus tells us. That when we do this according to his command, he feeds us on himself. We know that spiritually, for his body is in heaven currently, so we feast on him spiritually. And he's really here. He's, He's actually with us spiritually. Technically, he's bringing us into the heavenly places with God. But do I know the exact physics of how a a bite of bread and a half ounce of juice are then going to nourish my soul? I, I can't explain to you all of those physics. But I can tell you that the one who has told me that is reliable. And he's good and he's true. And he's freely offered forgiveness of sins in Jesus. It's why we get to see the goodness of his commands. It's also why this table has a fence set around it, meaning it's got a safety protector because something so special happens here. We feast on Jesus. It's why if if you don't know Jesus, you don't take the table. Don't take the supper. Uh, If you are so involved in sin that you think you got it and you're just not interested in Jesus anymore, that grieves my soul please don't take it. Instead, come talk to me and let's discuss what repentance sounds like. If you are a child who's not yet been admitted to the table, we want to share this with you. We want you to make sure you know what you're doing now. And so we ask that you not take until you're admitted to the table with the elders, uh, by the elders. And we'd love to do that. So talk to your parents when you're ready and you want to join the church in that way. Everyone else, the weak, the wounded, the weary, Come feast on Jesus. Let's give thanks. Lord, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, whose body was broken and blood poured out on our behalf. We thank you for these ordinary elements, and we ask that you would do something supernatural with them. Feed us Christ, we pray, in his name. Having given thanks and break the bread ministering in his name, Uh, And we'll serve it to you. Now, we're going to do things a little differently. This is our first kind of post-COVID communion. Uh, What we're going to ask is that, um, small enough numbers, I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to ask that you, I'm going to do side at a time. You stand, you're going to come down the center aisle. Uh, We have tongs to to serve you bread, and we've got the wine graciously spaced so you can reach it easily. Uh, What we would ask is that if you wish to partake, um, that when you walk by uh, Dwight here, hold out your hand so he can just drop the bread into your hands. Go ahead and eat it here, and then grab the cup, drink it, and then you can head back to your seat. Uh, so that being said, if this side, if y'all wanna, you can just sort out as you wanna come, come down here and... Um
It's new learning experiences and a little bit out of routine. <laughs> the beautiful thing is though our practice has changed, guess what? Two verbs, eat and drink. Two objects, bread and wine. And what we do here is, though it feels a little different, feasting upon that same Savior. And so we give thanks for his sacrifice. Lord, we bless you. And we thank you that uh, even in this time where we acknowledge the frailty of <laughs> human existence, that we have a Savior who is not frail. He gave up his life voluntarily on the cross, and even death could not hold him. So we praise you that we may be blessed in him. Oh, Lord, please fill us with Christ. We want to know him and you and the spirit, and we wish to be like him. So we pray in his name. Amen. Let's stand and sing at the Lamb's High Feast. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Amen.